me too. <laughs> oh my, what a gorgeous morning and what a gorgeous group of people I am looking at. Oh my, I'm impressed with y'all. So, good morning. Good morning. Oh, I love that. Go to my head and I love it. The Lord Christ be with you. And also with you. My name is Vanessa Lawson, and I am one of the privileged members here. And it's my honor to welcome you to each of these Maysville first and be with us and have a time of praise. We are truly glad you joined us. We also want to welcome our radio listeners on WYMC and people watching on Facebook. If you are watching through Facebook, you can let us know that you are. You can make a comment in the section there, and you can make a prayer request in the comment section. You can say hello to us in that comment section. You can also be bold enough to say I'm enjoying the program in that comment section, <laughs> and it'd be okay. We need to especially pray for a few people. The tornado survivors, Eastern Kentucky flood survivors, Kate Cox, Hope Smith, the Reverend Selby Comer, Carol Barnes, Cindy Stevens, Sue Greer, who has returned to the bungalow. Uh, we got Shirley Carr, who is in Parkview Nursing Home in Paducah. Bruce Nedro, Jenny Reed Black, and Mary Wright. We also want to include Danny Carter. That's Joey's good-looking cousin. He's battling cancer and Parkinson's. So please send out your prayers, not only to him, to everybody on the list. And we also want to include the Mississippi tornado victims because we understand now what they're truly going through. So send the little prayers there. We want to lift up two of the churches in the Purchase District. This week's churches are Mason Chapel United Methodist Church and the Good Shepherd United Methodist Church, and their pastor is Reverend Steed Howe. The candle on my left, your right, is to represent these folks. Please keep them in your thought. Keep them in your prayers. You know, we all could use some prayers. So thank you for that ahead of time. Now, we need to make a few announcements, do that housekeeping stuff. It says, we ain't having no yoga class this afternoon. And then we need to turn to the back of your bulletin, and you will find all the Holy Week services listed. Please be in tune to them, keep them in your mind and your thought, and be a part of as many as you can. And then speaking of Holy Week, there will be no Wednesday night meal that week. That's April the 5th. Now let's do some shout outs. The Reverend Selby and Shirley Comer, we love you and we are thinking about you and we hope that you are doing well. The Mayfield Fire and Rescue, thank you for your service. And the Long Term Recovery Group, we thank you for your service to the community. Now, we're going to bring up Miss Jennifer Walker, and she got a word or two to say to y'all. Good morning. Good morning. Shan Moore asked me to talk about uh, Pathways to Discipleship. You got a little handout when you came in this morning. Uh, the Pathways of Discipleship are prayer, acts of mercy and justice, tithe, Hearing God, worship, atonement, or at one mint, yielding to God's will, and scripture. Uh, when Shan asked me to speak about this, I said, now, Shan, she wanted me to talk about study and prayer time. And I said, Shan, I'm not good like you. I don't have that morning time that she has, that she really delves into things. And she said, well, talk about what you do, because that's manageable for anybody. <laughs> so. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, the thing that helps me most in study is preparing for Sunday school on Sunday mornings. 
um, that we in our small group and if you don't belong to a class we'd like to invite you to ours we're the new beginnings class and we meet at the uh, outreach 316 building immediately following worship um, we have done some wonderful studies and reading and preparing for those really helps me uh, to focus and to spend time with God in prayer and study. Um, and I'd like to, to share with you uh, a tip I have, and it's going to be participatory for a minute. I need everyone to close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now I want you, I want you to think about... I want you to think about today's power verse. Okay, open your eyes. When you thought about today's power verse, raise your hand if you thought about that sound that comes from the back booth to alert us to the power verse. Raise your hand if you thought about the sound, if you heard the sound. Okay? Raise your hand if you tried to picture it in the bulletin, where it was in the bulletin. Ah, okay. My parents sent me to that fine Methodist college in Jackson, Tennessee. And this is one of the things that I learned in one of my educational psychology classes about whether you were primarily an auditory learner or a visual learner. Now, we're all both, but some of us are heavier on one side than the other. And mine is visual. If I don't write it down, it's like it never happened to me. Um, so I need to read it, and what helps me even more is if I say it out loud. So when I read scripture, I read it aloud. And if you walked into the room, you might think I'm crazy, but that helps me remember things. It's why we sing, right? He who sings prays twice. We are reading it and we are saying it. So I'd like to offer that to you when you are going through your study in your pathway to discipleship when you are reading scripture, try reading it aloud so that you are both hearing it and seeing it in the hopes that it is being planted right down where it needs to be. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miss Jennifer. Now, let's see. I want to, um, I want to extend you the opportunity to remember. We say it, we hear it, we can read it. But this is about action. How do you follow through on this? We know that worship is not about coming and sitting in a pew. Worship is what we do. It's how we become a part of it. How do you learn to be a part of the worship here in the church? It ain't something you watch. Together, we are here to pray, to glorify, to give thanks to God through Jesus Christ for all the benefits and all the blessing of this life. How do we show that we receive those blessings and those benefits. And I believe every one of us does. Sometimes we need to show it in our action. Now, our prayer to open worship is found in the bulletin. If you will open up your bulletin, if you will uh, find it and get ready, and let's read that together. And let's read it like we mean it. God of life, you are the one to whom we call, for you are the one who hears and you are the one who acts. Bring us new life with your grace and love and power. Lead us in our time of worship that we may be prepared to follow your lead in places where life is at risk, places where hope seems far away, Places where dreams die during sleep. When we leave this wall, help us live the teaching we proclaim within this place of worship. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand. 
then turn to number 384 in your hymnal as we sing the first, second, and fourth verses of Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Now, if you will, please join me in the prayer of illumination, also found in your bulletin. Almighty God, to your hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ the Lord. Amen. All righty. Our first scripture reading today is from Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the 37 chapter, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out of, by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me around them. There were many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will call breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinew on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied that I have been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bones to its bones. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus said the Lord God, Come from four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesy as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. 
and we are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh, my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. And when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh, my people, I will put my spirit within you. And you shall live. And I will place you on your own soil. And then you shall know that I, the Lord, has spoken and will act and say the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We come now to a time of silent prayer. This is a chance for us to remember those things that we've been carrying around with us and to pray for those things that we've lifted up in the beginning of our service. And also to add to that list those names that we have not yet heard, that we've not yet spoken aloud. It's also a chance for us to listen to see what God would have us do about this. The passage from Ezekiel is a reminder that God wishes for us to live, and we are to live so that we might work and be found in obedience to God, answering the call of the, the needy to lift up those who are downtrodden. Think about those opportunities that God is placing before you as we pray silently together right now. Good morning, God. We are blessed to be in the place where we gather. We are blessed to be amongst friends and family. We are blessed to be amongst the household of God. We pray, O oh Lord, that the opportunities that we have here in this place during this time might be made the most of, both by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit and by the full engagement of our senses, the fullness of our attention. Help us to lay aside those expectations that we have come with and to take on instead the expectations that you place upon us. Open us to receive the inspiration of your Holy Spirit so that as we hear your words read, spoken, lived, that we might be inspired to take on that new life ourselves. For the expectations that we bring are often tainted by the world around us and by the secret longings of our hearts. Cleanse us now, O Lord, that we might live for you. For we seek to be amongst the living, the resurrected, those who have come forth from the grave and seek life. We remember the mighty acts of your son Jesus Christ, not the least of which is his imparting of prayer to his disciples, the words of which prayer we are Bold to pray together even now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A Psalter today is found on Psalms 130. You will find it on page 848 of the hymnal. And your part will be in bold. Out of the depths I cry to you, 
O oh Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you, O oh Lord, shall mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be worshipped. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. In the Lord's word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. With the Lord it is plenteous redemption. And the Lord will redeem Israel from all iniquity. Let's stand once again. Turn to number 467 as we sing all of trust and obey. Our next scripture reading is from Romans, Romans the 8th chapter, verses 6 through 11. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. Since the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, then the body is dead of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who is raised Jesus from the Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. 
the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. We come now to a time of giving, a time of remembering the blessings that we have received by God's hand and a time of giving back some of those blessings. Some of those blessings are financial and for our purposes today in the sanctuary, you have opportunities to give using the offering boxes. You can also log on to our website and use our giving portal there. Uh, all you have to do is find one of the tabs that says giving and Follow the instructions, and your bank talking to our bank will make sure that your financial contribution goes immediately to work for the church's general fund. You also can give with uh, text messaging on your uh, cell phone by texting the word GIVE with a dollar amount to 364-999-4480, or you can mail your gift in to Mayfield First United Methodist Church, Post Office Box 766, Mayfield, Kentucky, 42066. And the last part of that zip code is important now, 0034. If you'll add that to anything that you're mailing to the church office, it'll get here a little bit quicker. We also want to make sure that you are aware of the opportunities to give that do not involve your finances. There are plenty of things that you can do to work for the kingdom of God. One of those things is working on the house that we are building for one of our tornado survivors that we're sponsoring. Tommy has all of the information about how you can participate there. Catch him before he heads off to Sunday school or give him a call in the office and find out what you can do, how you can be a part of that. We're looking for painters. We're looking for folks for insulation. Insulation week, and then after the drywall goes up and all that good stuff, we'll be taking care of all of the accoutrements that go into a house after that's done, the, the painting, the installation of appliances. So whatever your niche is there, just let us know how you can be uh, available and how we can get in touch with you so that we can schedule you for one of the work crews. But that's not all that you can do. There are plenty of things in life that allow you to reach out to your neighbors around you and to be a part of the ministry of the church. If you're looking for a way to use your gifts and talents, please let me know. Give me a call in the office, and I'll be happy to guide you and counsel you and find you some work for the kingdom. In the meantime, we will all stand together and sing the words of the doxology, praising God and giving God the gift of our voices as we sing together. Please be seated. Rather than standing for the reading of the gospel, again, we have a long pericope today, and I don't want to put you through that. It's a good two pages, but it's a very good two pages. John, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 45. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair, and her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed an additional two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. Mm. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. That's Thomas with all the positivity in the world. 
When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus was already in the tomb, four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When, they, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you now. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. And they followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in his spirit. And deeply moved, he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of God for you who are the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's turn in your hymnals to number 368 as we sing the first verse of My Hope is Built. power verse sound. Take a look at the top of your bulletin and read that together with me. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Uh. We've been doing a lot of construction around here lately, and I've been in and out of houses that were in various states of repair and construction. One of my favorite things to do is to show up when they're working on the framing. Every time I go in and they're sawing up those two by fours and they're setting the, the walls and, and making sure that they're firmly attached to the foundation, there's a smell that goes along with it. There's a smell of two by fours that have been freshly cut. And every time I smell that, I'm back in the presence of my father. 
My dad built houses. And there were many, many times that I spent helping him while he was working on those houses or in the basement when he was working on a project, usually a science fair project that was due the next day and it was about 3 o'clock in the morning. And every time that skill saw went off, I heard that sound and I smelled that smell. And now it takes me right back to where my dad was in those moments. I also get that same feeling when I'm walking through those buildings that are in that state of disrepair where the the studs are still visible because the electric hasn't been put in and the plumbing hasn't been done or it's been torn out so that it can be replaced. And I remember as a kid thinking how cool it was that every part of the wall was a door and going through those studs and being able to fit through those and I'm not able to fit through all of those studs anymore like I used to but... There's a a, a moment when you're in that house and you can look around and see that the house has good bones. I've heard that dozens and dozens of times as we were purchasing houses for the new lease on life program and trying to figure out which ones of these are worth uh, purchasing and and figuring out which ones are, are going to be renewable so that we can put folks in them on a lease program that will allow them to build some generational wealth, that will allow them to move in and and have a home that they can call their own, even if they're leasing for a short amount of time. I learned from my uncle who also built a few houses with my maternal grandfather for whom my dad worked for a time. I remember going through houses with him and seeing how he would assess the houses that he was looking to buy or looking to move into. He moved quite a bit when he was a chemical engineer. And what he would do is he would walk in and he would find a a door facing and he would put his hand on either side and he would push. And if there was a crack or a creak or a give of some kind, he would kind of look at the house with a different eye. He would start to think maybe the bones weren't so good. He would start to think that maybe there was something that was fundamentally unsound about the house. And when we walk through construction these days, we're still doing the same sorts of things. We're looking for good bones. But this bears directly on the church as well. We're looking around at the church to see, are there good bones here? I'm happy to report that there are. There are sound and solid foundations upon which we have built tradition after tradition. There are sound relationships within our congregation and within our connection that will allow us to go forward and do things that we've only dreamed about to this point. And I have to say that as I'm reading through this passage of Scripture and hearing the words of the prophet Ezekiel again, I'm reminded that Ezekiel wasn't just telling us that everything's going to be fine because we're going to put it back exactly the way that it was. Because that's not what Ezekiel was saying. That's not what the prophecy was about. Ezekiel was prophesying that the kingdom was going to return, but it was going to be a different kind of kingdom. You see, Ezekiel and Jeremiah both in different places, Ezekiel in the the captivity in Babylon and Jeremiah back home trying to shepherd the folks who were still wondering, where'd everybody go and (laughs) where's God in all of this? Both of those prophets spent quite a good bit of their time helping people to understand that when God comes back and the glory re-inhabits the temple, that there are going to be a few changes. You see, the, the people of Israel had a hard time, even as they were being carted off, even as they had been defeated in battle and taken away in chains, they still had this notion that God was on the throne, that God was bringing the Davidic line to its fruition, that Jerusalem was the favorite place and nothing could happen outside of Jerusalem and the temple was going to be the central theme for everything that they did and that they were the chosen people of God. And Ezekiel spent a long time throughout his life, actually, helping people to unfold the prophecies alongside the unfolding of history that would help them to understand that these promises that had been made were not broken by God, but had been broken by God's people. You see, like so many people who try to be good children of God and to be obedient to their father, to be good Christ followers in our situation, there are moments when we get all excited about something that has absolutely nothing to do with what God wants us to do. And in those moments, Ezekiel said, 
there are consequences. Ezekiel never said that God was out of control, that this was all something that happened, that God couldn't do anything about it. Instead, Ezekiel and Jeremiah both said this was the work that God allowed to take place for the edification of God's people so that they could see that the promises that they had broke in God's presence were not necessarily the promises that they needed to be building their lives and hopes and dreams upon. And so when Ezekiel starts to talk about the bones of Israel coming back together with new flesh, new sinew, and a brand new breath that was going to enliven that new body, this was Ezekiel trying to say to folks, you're getting a second chance but you're not getting a second chance to do the same thing that you did the first time. Don't go back and make those same mistakes that you made. These are, these are things that we talk about in CR. These are things we talk about with brand new Christians, folks who have repented of sin and started down a pathway of discipleship. We try to remind them this is not you getting back on your feet with God's help so that you can go back and make all the same mistakes over and over again. This is Ezekiel saying this to an entire nation of folks who had built their identity upon the idea that, that David was king and his line was eternal. We know now that it is not eternal. Except in the fact that Jesus, taking God's place on the throne, restored the kingdom of Israel to its rightful owner. That is God. This is a new way of being. And this is one of those prophecies that starts to point to God becoming king again through Jesus Christ. Now, there are still traits of that Yahwistic cult that was part of these promises that folks were holding on to, that it's got to be this way or it's not going to be valid. But Ezekiel was trying to get them to understand there are new things happening here. And though Jesus traced traced his lineage back to David, it was his lineage to God that put him on the throne. What happens when we hold on to the promises that were made to us, the promises that we ended up breaking ourselves? What happens when we hold on to those instead of grabbing a hold of the new things that God is doing? What happens when we rise up out of the grave only to go back to the same things that put us in the grave in the first place? What happens when we hold on to what we want more tightly than we hold on to what God wants for us? You want to talk about faith. It's easy to hold on to those <laughs> things that we've had for years, those ideas those habits, those traditions, those, those notions of what it means to be church and what it means to be a disciple, it's so easy to hold on to those, even, even if we've been convinced that they are not necessarily the thing that God wants us to hold on to. It's easy because they are familiar. And it takes a great deal of faith for us to walk out a door and to look toward God and say, wherever you are going, that's where I want to be. Because, folks, God goes to some crazy, scary places. Let me tell you. And God is asking us to follow. God is reminding us through this story that comes to us from the prophet Ezekiel that there is something beyond the grave. And whether we're mistakenly thinking of the grave as a, a time of sleep or the grave as a time of temporary uh, non-consciousness, we have to understand that God wakes people up from the dead all the time. And we move from that metaphor into reality when we get to talking about the last day, which is what Lazarus' sister thought Jesus was going to promise her one more time. We'll all be together in that general resurrection when everybody's getting up, stretching a little bit, and heading off to the kingdom. Jesus wants you to know that you can do some stretching and yawning right here, right now. And crawl up out of the grave, out of the death that you've been holding on to, out of the holding on to the past kind of death that we've all been sort of dragging around with us. I can't, I can't tell you how many times 
I've had to answer the question, are y'all going to build back just like you were? <laughs> are you going to go back to that same place on that block? And the answer is no. Even if we were able to find stone that matched exactly and the carpet that matched exactly, we would never put it back exactly the way it was, no matter how many experts we brought in, how many engineers we had working with us to get that creek on that step going up to the second landing just right, just like it was. Why would you want it back just the way it was? And when you unstack that three-story birthday cake, there's not enough land on that northern block that we own. So we're already hearing engineers saying, look at this vast quantity of land you have on the southern block, over where this parking lot is, over where the mission building is, Project 316 building, and that huge green space that I don't think anybody's aware of except maybe Pedro because Pedro mows it for us. Thank you <laughs> so much. And before him, James, who did the tree line and made sure that those trees were trimmed back. We have to think about all of the things that we have and all the places that we get to go, all of the ideas that we get to explore, not just buildings, but maybe a new way of being church. What if I told you that church isn't always about having a set regimen of program ministries? that has one person in charge of this and one person in charge of that, and you have a whole list of officers doing this, and then 19 different Sunday school classes broken out by age and demographic. Oh, my goodness. What if I told you that church could be self-actuated disciples seeing a need and meeting a need without hierarchy, without organization, without Robert's Rules of Order? Eric, that's where you say amen. Amen. <laughs> Our new church council chair, folks. When you get into the idea that everything has to be regimented, you bring to life the prophecy of one of my favorite authors, Leonard Sweet. Lynn is known amongst United Methodist clergy as one of our brilliant thinkers. Some folks say he's never had an unpublished thought, but <laughs> I'm here to tell you that one of his best ideas, among many good ideas, is the fact that the church is perfectly prepared for intense and effective ministries if the 1950s ever roll back around. Because in the 50s, we were organized to the nth degree. We were organized for all kinds of purposes. United Methodist women, United Methodist men, everybody had a gavel. There was something for somebody to do everywhere. There was an officer's position in every organization of the church. Every Sunday school class had an officer structure. We don't need that. Not anymore. That way of thinking was regimented and it organized us and it allowed us to, to do things that needed to be meticulously covered. But folks, there's so much work to do and there's so many places to do it. We just need to all go out and I don't know, it, 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 feels, like, it feels like something out of the Boy Scouts where you just kind of line up and you're responsible for the path that's right in front of you. Walk down through that field, that glade, and pick up all the trash that's just within your reach, just within your responsibility. You don't need to ask anybody. You don't need to have anybody send you. The only organization is you stand in a line and make sure that you're t fingertip to fingertip with your arms stretched out wide, and you're responsible for whatever it is that you can reach. That's the kind of organizational structure that the church needs now. Not a, an organizational structure of the brain, but an organizational structure of the senses. What do you see that needs doing? What have you heard about that just ain't right that needs fixing? What's out of place that needs your hand on it to put it back where it needs to be? Who has fallen down and needs you to reach out to help pick them back up? What are the policies and processes in our community local, state, federal, whatever, that don't pass the sniff test. It's time for us to start utilizing our full sensory package here to recognize all of the things that are going on in the world that aren't exactly where the kingdom would have them to be. And the only way we can do this is to abandon the idea that we're just a pile of dry bones to abandon the idea that we are lying in a valley somewhere and it's going to take a, a big old miracle of resurrection to bring us back. 
It took only the prophesied word of God and the breath of God also prophesied to re-inhabit these newly made bodies. And if we're going to be the body of Christ, and folks, we are going to be the body of Christ, we have to take on new sinew, new flesh, so that as we are covered and encased in fleshed beings, so too must the body of Christ, the church, be newly encased, newly enfleshed, and not in a building. The building is a tool. It isn't the church. Raise your hand if you're the church. All right, raise your hand if you're the church. <laughs> All right, if your hand's not up, raise your hand if you're the church. <laughs> it's a rhetorical question. It's not a quiz. If you can hear the sound of my voice and you are worshiping the same Jesus I'm worshiping, you are the church. We have a place. And it's not necessarily bound up by all these rules and organizational principles, even though we are the Methodists. we got to have a committee for everything. You don't have to have a committee for everything. Sometimes you just methodically go about your discipleship and you just do it. We have experienced death. We have seen death. We have seen destruction. We have gone through a long period of waiting and hoping and planning. And we're coming now to a time when we're going to sit down and talk with architects and we're going to get focused on the building and it's going to be really easy for that to just suck all the air right out of the room because it's going to be all about nails and it's going to be all about what kind of windows and it's going to be about how long the steps go and how far up the ramp we have to go to get to our class and whether it's pews or chairs don't start with Mitzi she will have it out with you the church is being rebuilt and so is the building the church is being rebuilt and so is the building. And that means, in the words of Ezekiel, there's going to be some changes. There are going to be some new ways for us to do things. Some of them will be the old things that we're used to. Some of it, some of it will be a bit strange to us because it's a new way of accomplishing those older things. But no matter what it is, it's going to require all of us standing shoulder to shoulder, fingertip to fingertip, walking through our community and finding things along our path that need to be addressed. And when you come to something that's too big for you to pick up, you tap the person next to you and say, hey, give me a hand with this. And if it's too big for the two of you, you tap two or three people down the line. Hey, help me with this. Let's do this together. And if it's too big for that small group, get a bigger group until maybe you have to get the entire church. And if it's too big for the entire church, we're connectional. Get the district involved. Get a sister church involved. And recognize that you don't always have to just go to another church. You might go to the high school and find a class of kids that needs the community service hours. You might go to a local business and say, hey, we would like to partner with you. We'll fund it if you can provide materials. Let's all do this together. I'm told that's how church used to be. We get so caught up in making sure that the boxes are checked and everything's numbered and the bullet points are all in a row and alphabetized and sent off to the district office and to the General Commission on Finance and Administration. Did you know we had one of those? That's all I hear about some days. But we cannot forget that the basic building block, no matter what the book of discipline says, write that down. I said, no matter what the book of discipline says, it's the individual disciple who is the basic building block of the United Methodist Church. Believe it or not, it actually says it's the annual conference. Annual conferences get a lot done, but they don't get a lot done around here unless it's us doing it, maybe in partnership with the other folks. Supported by the annual conference, yes. But the basic building block of the United Methodist Church is the United Methodist, and that's you. Sitting where you're sitting and getting ready to go wherever it is you're getting ready to go. There's death outside these doors. 
There's people who are dying and they don't even know it. There's some people who are dying and they do know it and they want to stop dying. And they need to hear from someone who has learned the secret that's not a secret on how to live. So whether you look to Ezekiel who prophesied to the dry bones, prophesied to the breath of life, or you look to Jesus who spoke the name of a friend and asked him, commanded him to come out of his grave and then told the community, unbind him. Take him out of these grave cloths. Unbind him. When Jesus starts in on that, we're the community that comes in and takes away those strips of cloth that are holding poor Lazarus back. And do you know how many folks out there are in the same situation as poor Lazarus? People who have died because of their sin, people who are dying because of their sin, people who have given up because of their sin, and we know the author of life. So to you, the bones of the church, the good bones of the church, awaiting fresh sinew, fresh muscle, new flesh, I say to you the same thing that Ezekiel said, the same thing that Jesus said. It is time to live. Let us pray. Almighty God, we sit before you trembling, afraid of dying, afraid of expending our entire life in the moment, afraid of sacrificing ourselves, afraid that we're going to stand up for something and get mowed down by the world that says otherwise, we are terrified, God, whether we want to admit it or not. And that terror goes so far as to make it hard for us to even stand up for the small things, to participate in the easiest aspect of what it means to be the body of Christ. We admit our fear. And we ask for the courage that comes from you so that we might face it. We believe that you'll send life. We believe that you will raise up the body of Christ once again, just as you did on that Easter morning, the first time. But we're afraid that that body might be us. And so we look to the tasks that need doing and we wonder who will do them. We look to the things that need saying and we wonder who will say them. We look to the scary places that need inhabiting and we wonder who will go, who will be sent for the sake of your name. Help us to be brave. Help us to live. Because it is time and past time for life to flow forth from this place and throughout our community. For it is not only your will, it is the will and example of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. We seek to be obedient servants of his. Amen. If you're new to Christianity and you're scared of what you just heard, but you still want to follow Jesus anyway, I invite you to come forward. If I've scared you too much to make that commitment today, come talk to me. It's not nearly as terrifying as you think. Not when God is on your side. If you have given your life to God and have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, but somewhere along the way you started holding back and keeping something for yourself and telling God he could have as much as he wanted until it came to this point, but no further, maybe you're ready to let that line go. Would you come and say so before the congregation? Would you come and say so before Almighty God? Recognizing that God calls us to new heights. Not of our greatness, but of His. If you're part of another congregation and you feel like God may be calling you to be a part of this one, 
Make sure you've said your goodbyes. Don't just ghost them. It hurts. Once you've said goodbye to your friends in the pews, your friends in your classes, your pastor, whoever needs those words of explanation. Once you've done all that, come back and say your vows and make your covenant with this congregation. And finally, for those who simply need to come and pray about anything, but certainly about something that maybe moved you in the sermon or something that moved you in the reading of Scripture or something that moved you in the singing of the songs or maybe just something that moved you before you ever got here. Make your commitments. Ask your questions so that we might together live. The hymn of dedication is My Hope is Built. It's found on page 368. And life is found wherever Jesus calls you. And he may be calling you to these chancel rails today. Don't miss this. Please stand. This afternoon at 2 o'clock, the presentation of my doctoral dissertation will take place here. You are welcome to come in. John will be frisking folks for tomatoes and other <laughs> hurled objects. <laughs> We're going to have a good time. It's going to be a little bit dry, but not too dry because it's going to be our story. It's going to be how we got through COVID and how we did distance worship and how that impacts other churches who might be considering virtual worship or hybrid worship like we do and the theological implications of that. It's also a chance to peel back the curtain and see how we made some of those decisions, or at least how I guided the congregation theologically through that and how we made those decisions together. So I welcome you at 2 o'clock. Um, there's also Sunday school afterwards. If you don't have a Sunday school class, make sure you're figuring out where you're going from this place and into your next place. If you're a member of a Sunday school class, would you just raise your hand? If you're not a member of a Sunday school class and would like to go to a Sunday school class, look for those folks who had their hands up and follow them wherever they go. And like a little puppy, maybe they'll take you in and feed you and all that good stuff. So, yeah, just be, be careful who you follow, right? Whatever happens when you leave this place, live for Jesus. Live in such a way that folks know that you're living for Jesus. Not to draw attention and glory to yourselves, but to draw attention and glory to God. Let the benediction be our guide as we make our way from this place. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Time to live.